setting up my timer here. I, I, I apologize, I've got a, a text here which I'm going to sort of half read because if I don't, I wind up like on tangents and you get a lot of this wave, arm waving stuff. And so, uh, so I apologize on that, but honestly, it's for your own good. Uh, first, let me ask, are there anyone here who's a historian? Okay, so here, actually I can probably make you all historians really, really briefly. Repeat after me. It's complicated. <laughs> That, that's, that's the essence of what we do, really. It's, it's complicated. We like messiness. We're very happy to embrace messiness and, and, and so on. So um, anyway, hello. Uh, I'm Eric Nystrom, and I'm here on behalf of myself and my co-author, David Tannenhaus, also a historian. Um, and we'd like to begin by saying how grateful we are to have this case law access project data to work with uh, and how exciting it is to be here in Cambridge to learn from you all and discuss our work today. And I think it is important to mention at the outset that we're both historians, David and I. Uh, his emphasis is legal history. Mine is, in this context, is digital history. Uh, so I, since he, he's, I'm here, he's not, uh, you're probably going to get a little bit more emphasis on the data side. Uh, I'm very happy to talk like nitty gritty stuff like that. But uh, hopefully I can also address uh, some of the, the legal questions uh, that arise from our work. Um, so we're currently working on a project that began with a simple question. Uh, from the days of John Marshall to John Roberts, how have the justices of the US Supreme Court conceived of the court's role? Uh, in particular, we focused on the term our, O-U-R. Uh, when court opinion writers use this possessive pronoun, what exactly were they talking about? Uh, we tackled this analysis using a combination of publicly available data sets, including full text of Supreme Court opinions, hand corrections of metadata, and custom-built digital tools. This work was nearly complete when we learned about the case law access project, so we re-implemented the project using CAP data. Uh, this permitted us to make more fine-grained and robust interpretations of our findings, but it also opens the opportunity for a comparative discussion of multiple full-text Supreme Court opinion data sets. Uh, so today, our presentation will use the Our project to frame a comparative discussion of using these full-text Supreme Court uh, opinions for digital legal history. We'll compare our two approaches first using the Supreme Court database together with data from courtlistener.com uh, and then using SCDB and CAP. You guys call it CAP, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll also discuss our digital toolkit and then we'll conclude by demonstrating how this approach allowed us to see that the Supreme Court has two distinctive uses of our, one that signals a procedural stance and the other that invokes the possessive to frame the court's issues in dialogue with broader statements about America's history and heritage. So I'd like to say a few words about the assumptions and approaches that David and I brought to this project. I know we've got a variety of disciplines, obviously, and no historians except for honorary ones. Um, and I think it's important to be a clear, up front, clear up front about some of the decisions that we made. Uh, we approach this study as we've approached others in our ongoing collaboration from a position of explicit commitment to favoring explainability, repeatability, and comprehension over technological, computational, or st statistical innovation. We needed to be able to explain what we did and why it matters to our fellow historians and to be accountable to ourselves for explaining any computational approaches that we took so that our conclusions could be understood and assessed by the same process historians bring to any, evaluating any other evidence. And that process, I can say, is uh, nuanced. Um, anal is another uh, synonym uh, for that. Um, in a 2016 article, we labeled this computational modesty a no magic approach. And frankly, we realized that relatively old tools and approaches could yield results that were very interesting to historians. That also helped. Um, our approach also included embracing open source software and a scripted layered data approach, building tools that process data in incremental steps where the stages could be examined and tested as needed and the results were reproduced consistently. For this project, I used Perl along with Awk and other Unix utilities. Uh, the other component of this approach is an acceptance of some degree of brute force in creating useful transformations of data. I'll discuss a bit more about this in a few moments, but whether it be computational, that is, emphasizing comprehensibility at the expense of optimization, uh, or non-computational, such as a historian sitting down with a list of more than 3,000 words and just manually evaluating their meaning, uh, we considered such techniques an important part of our problem-solving toolkit. And neither David nor I are uh, burdened uh, with having a uh, graduate student research assistant labor because we're historians, um, you know. So we basically do this stuff ourselves. Okay, uh, with all that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about the project that spurred this comparison. Uh, the initial inspiration for this article developed uh, out of a project that Maximo Langer, a professor of comparative law at UCLA, uh, and David were working on about the adversary system in American law and culture. As part of their research, they had pinpointed when the US Supreme Court began, first began using the term our adversary, our adversary system in the 1940s. 
they also noticed that during the same time period, opponents of desegregation in California argued that Mexican-American children who didn't know our history should not be allowed in white schools. David then reached out to me to see if he and I could do a digital project that analyzed how the Supreme Court used the term our. Uh, one of the questions that interested him was whether the 1940s were a period during which the justices invoked American history and traditions because of the crisis of World War II. Uh, he was also interested in whether judicial uses of our fit into the court's embracing of the concept of pluralism as a way to understand American society and the proper role of constitutional law. It seemed like it might be possible to mine the full text opinions of Supreme Court uh, to try and find and perhaps categorize these kinds of uses. Based on early experience, we turned to courtlistener.com as a source of full text, bulk downloadable SCOTUS opinions, uh, and I'll discuss the structural features of court listener data here in just a second. Uh, from there, we corrected the court listener data, uh, connected it to, to, corrected the metadata, I should say, uh, connected it to metadata about court opinions from the Supreme Court database. Um, with these two sources together, we explored the changing frequency of the use of the term our by the Supreme Court, especially with reference to particular justices and periods of history. We attempted a simple classification based on contextual words appearing near our, and also explored the language of the court in several specific cases in detail, a traditional close read. Uh, we prepared a paper, workshopped it at the West Coast Rhetoric Conference at the UNLV Boyd School of Law in November 2018, and we're considering how to finish revisions when I learned about the Case Law Access Project. And it turned out that, case, that CAP was a, a better data set for what we hoped to achieve, so we built a new analysis program tool chain and are currently in the final uh, stages of, of rewriting based on this new data. Uh, so that's how we got here. Uh, so next I'd like to compare CAP and, and Court Listener as sources of full text data and discuss some of the common and unique properties of each. I'm going to end up saying, sounding a little bit more positive uh, for, here for CAP, uh, probably not unwelcome given this audience, I suppose. Um, but I do want to say at the outlet, the outset that what Court Listener did uh, to provide access to full text opinion at that degree of, of scale, uh, you know, without the kind of heavy lift of, of a major OCR project like you guys had, really is quite remarkable and deserves a lot of praise. So we were very happy to have that data until you guys came along and made us happier to have yours. So, um, so talking about court, court Listener, uh, it's a website that provides bulk download of legal data. It's an effort of the Free Law Project. Their web interface has some interesting features, but for our purposes, it's the bulk data that's really of interest. Uh, they distribute their bulk data in a series of tarballs that are organized by court, in other words, a little more narrow than CAP. Um, within these, there are individual JSON files, one per item. They'll also give you a tarball of tarballs, so you can get everything uh, all at once. And each of these uh, JSON files offers the opinion text in one or more formats, such as HTML or plain text, which appear to generally be dependent on where they obtained uh, that full text initially. One frustrating part of working with court listeners is that most of the metadata is in a file separate from the opinion text. Uh, there are a couple of other features too that I'll mention in, in uh, just a moment. And so I'm going to uh, skip over here the a description of the CAP data structure since I presume that you're all uh, relatively familiar with it already. But I do want to note very quickly for the sake of comparison, when we're talking about bulk data anyway, um, that the CAP contains all the case and opinion information in a JSON object uh, one per case, which does make it much easier to deal with, and that the cases are grouped together in large JSON files by jurisdiction, uh, though here that's at the very highest level uh, as opposed to court, uh, court listeners grouping by court level. Okay, so with those features in mind, let's do a few quick com comparisons. First, there were several essential properties that both data sets shared that were the baseline essential requirements that enabled us to do the, the study. Uh, available full text, uh, the breadth of the coverage for us, of course, as historians, chronological was absolutely essential. Uh, and having other courts was key. We kind of kept that in reserve. Someday we're going get, to get around to doing these other things. Uh, with that. Um, and then, of course, the availability of bulk access, both to us personally as researchers and in theory to other historians. And let me just say as an aside there, personally as researchers, um, you know, I began my career at a small uh, college and we didn't have a law school. I can't get to LexisNexis from there, right? And I can't get to, I, I still at ASU, I'm not a member of the law faculty, I can't use Westlaw. I can, I can drive an hour to downtown Phoenix, bring my thumb drive, sit at a, a computer in the, the law library and use Westlaw if I want to, right? But like, there are some real access questions. And so bulk, available, uh, bulk availability is, is a major, major important uh, part of this. So anyway, so those, everybody has those, that's, that's great. Um, there are also some shared problem areas, uh, OCR errors, metadata errors, duplicate cases, missing cases, um, manipulating JSON can be a pain in the neck. Um, I think that's fair to say. You guys, you techie people might disagree with me, but that's fine. Um, okay, so there are some things I think the court listener does well and that I liked. Uh, one is that they integrated the Supreme Court database ID number. Uh, that made uh, certain elements of what we were trying to do 
uh, much easier. The second is that they had this case per file bulk data structure, which meant that uh, if I'm accessing this stuff at a file level, uh, there were ways of, of cutting my workload specifically when I wanted to narrow down to, to some things that were smaller than uh, units of, of study that were smaller than, uh, than, than the whole thing uh, as a whole. A third thing that they had that I thought was quite interesting is they had a citator built into it. Um, it wasn't very good, uh, in my opinion. I, I also have done a project using uh, Shepard's data and some other stuff like this, and, and based on those comparisons, my sense is that their citator, which was derived from using some kind of regular expression to find citations in the text, probably got anywhere from about 50 to 80% to of the citations. Probably, I wouldn't trust it any farther than that. Um, but it's intriguing that it's there. Um, they also had seemingly better coverage for very recent cases. Uh, the Case Law Access Project, um, in my opinion, at least looking at the Supreme Court stuff, didn't do a particularly good job with the stuff from the 2012 session forward. Um, not a problem for me as a historian. I just cut off my analysis as my advisor once told me, you know, if, you, if you're writing and you're writing and you're writing about Woodrow Wilson and, and you have 300 pages and you've only gotten to, to high school, you stop and you change the title, The Young Life of Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, court listener um, also uh, didn't require any kind of research or registration permission kind of thing, which, again, that kind of equity question, if you're on the outside and it's like, oh, Harvard says you've got to justify yourself, like, you know, like I don't know, that's a little, that's a little creepy, like a little scary. Um, you know, corporate overlords, I don't know. You know. Okay, um, now CAP, of course, has uh, some advantages over court listener as well. The distinction between multiple opinions in the same case, the majority opinion, dissent, or whatever, is huge, key, very important to us. Uh, better chronological coverage, seemingly better OCR. Uh, when I say seemingly, you're hearing my opinions, basically, based on getting my hands uh, deep and dirty in this data. Uh, seemingly fewer duplicate cases, seemingly better metadata, and this, this effort to build a community around the project. Um, for our project, the multiple opinion separation and the superior chronological coverage ended up being the key factors in favor of using CAP, uh, although I'm very happy to, to benefit from better OCR, obviously. Ultimately, with CAP, we found more examples in what should have been the same data. With Court Listener, after corrections, we found 66,264 individual matches of the word hour, contained in 9,590 <coughs> individual opinions. By contrast, with the CAP data, we found 79,152 individual matches uh, across all opinion types through that, that 2011 court session, contained in 15,000 plus individual opinions. So that's 12,888 more results from 5,422 more cases. Fully 18.85% of the universe of SCDB cases uh, appeared in CAP, but not in Court Listener. Uh, so most of the difference is due to better, better coverage of cases in CAP. Uh, but some of the additional results, I think, are probably due to uh, they being better able to identify hits because of better OCR. OK. So then connecting with the Supreme Court database. Choosing CAP meant I had to figure out some way to connect this uh, with the additional metadata of the Supreme Court database in order to perform some of the analyses that we've done in the original paper. And I, this is where I might part ways with Benjamin, with Benjamin's research assistant, I guess, technically. I can pick on him because he's not here, right? Like, that's, that's okay? Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't find it particularly easy. The first task was, obviously, I downloaded the, the thing, started exploring it, figuring out tools to manipulate it, uh, worked out a, a parole routine to allow me to read the incoming JSON from standard inner from a file, and it'll handle either pretty printed or the original format uh, pretty effectively. And I did this in a way that doesn't kill the memory of the machine. It's a, a serial kind of thing. And I use this routine in each of my tools. So to connect with the SCDB, I essentially created a left join of uh, SCDB to cap data on the basis of the reporter citation. Uh, that meant that if the case was in SCDB, it went into my list whether or not it could be found in CAP. Um, and I noted all those cases whose reference couldn't be found in CAP, as well as those with multiple matching references. Um, and it's important to note that the SCDB itself contains a subset of all US Supreme Court opinions. Right. Um, the project's documentation is a little bit unclear on what exactly gets included. In one place, they say that it has each case decided by the court. In, elsewhere, they say it contains every argued case. I think that argued case is really the more accurate one. Um, and so it leaves out some cases where the court took little action, like a denial of cert. Um, in looking closely at the data, there are also at least a handful that they just miss altogether. Uh, that's that's pretty clear. Uh, they're pretty good, though. And uh, SCDB's list is widely used by anyone studying the Supreme Court, so it's got a reputation for being authoritative. Uh, so for this initial match, out of the 28,754 entries in the combined SCDB data sets, uh, there were 2,103 entries where no case was found in CAP with the exact reference. 
465 SCDB entries had multiple records in CAP uh, based on, on the, the reference. Um, and so that's a 91% success rate right off the bat. Um, and then I personally explored every one of these and rectified the errors by hand to the greatest degree that I could uh, using a combination of manual ex exploration of the CAP data, the SCDB data, and the page images of the US report set from the Library of Congress. This took me a couple of weeks of, of full-time effort. The bulk of the errors were from references that were mangled in the conversion from nominal reporter titles. Uh, there were a few other examples where a volume or a run of cases seems to have been omitted from CAP. Uh, didn't come off the shelf or someone had lost it or was using it as a doorstop, I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, some of those short notices start to cause trouble in the 1970s um, and everything after the 2011 SCOTUS uh, term was a complete mess with major difficulties in, in matching as I mentioned a moment ago. I couldn't reliably tell whether it was SEDB or CAP or bo uh, probably both, um, but it looked like there were a couple of missing volumes and then it got sort of even more complicated from there. Um, but again, that wasn't a big deal for us because uh, because we look backwards, we're historians. Um, so all told, I was unable to match only 696 of the 28,754 cases in SCDB, and up to and including 2011, the, two, the 2011 term, I should say, only 282 cases were missing, meaning that ultimately fewer than 1% of SCDB entries could not be found in CAP for the data we ultimately used. And of, I should mention, too, that of those 282, I think probably two-thirds of those are contained in two volumes that were missing, um, were and are missing, I assume. Um, so with this connection file constructed and corrected, I can use it in two ways. First, to incorporate additional metadata from SCDB, which, such as things like uh, the issues that are uh, at, at stake, the vote in the case, the majority opinion writer, the final vote, the areas of law, and so on. But second, and no less important, is that I can apply the SCDB map as a filter. It will weed out duplicates, it will accurately create a corpus of cases whose limits are known, permitting uh, comparisons such as the proportion of cases in a given year to be calculated. This is that baselining question. I, I didn't have that language before, but I really like that way of, of putting it. It gives me a baseline. Okay. So the basic heart of our analysis efforts is a series of uh, tab separated value files that contain information about cases that meet particular criteria, such as having one or more specified keywords, plus additional information added from outside in a layered sequence. We created and manipulated these with programs most written mostly in Perl and AUK. Uh, so you can tell I'm a fossil, right? Because I use these fossil <laughs> languages. Um, rather than spend time on working up a web or other GUI interface in the early stages of our analysis, over the course of my collaborations with David on several projects, uh, we've come to realize that for many tasks, it's straightforward for me just to send them TSV files converted into Excel. Uh, they're easy for me to generate. They open readily in, in, on his computer and he can manipulate them as he needs to. Uh, so we begin with a, con a tool to generate keyword and context or quick results uh, from the opinion text along with case metadata, used it to produce a list of all cases containing the word our in the United States jurisdiction JSON file. Then we add SCDB identification information, filtering non-SCDB cases at the same time. With the SCDB ID attached, we can incorporate additional information from there, such as majority opinion writer, area or issue of the law, or more. Uh, our primary tool produces one line in the TSV for every occurrence of the keyword, but we've also developed variations that will search for two or more keywords, that will present the words in a single contextual string, uh, one line per case, and, and, and so on. Um, we also developed a, a tool that will produce quick output that's tagged for part of speech, which helps us categorize these different uses of the term, and I'll say more about that in a second. Okay, so one of the original tensions at the heart of this project was that between different kinds of our uses, our is a slippery word, and its slipperiness is one of the elements of the appeal to, of trying to measure its use. Uh, in an opinion, our can mean very different things. Even a casual inspection of the cases containing the term suggested that many, perhaps even most uses could be considered to invoke it in a way to refer to judicial process on the one hand, uh, or heritage claiming and construction on the other. Uh, as an example here, we've got McCullough v. Virginia uh, from 1898, which is a case about using bonds or coupons to, to pay state taxes. This epitomizes a judicial process type uh, category case. Justice Brewer uses our to explain how the court makes its decisions. Eyes to palpable facts, jurisdiction, own opinion, jurisdiction, jurisdiction, duty, last decision. When the court says, quote, there is no doubt of our jurisdiction upon certiorari, unquote, or points a reader to, quote, the principles declared in our former decision, unquote, they're using the term in a court-centered, self-aware linguistic mode that highlights the court's judicial process and explicitly connects the court's ongoing existence rules and policies to its present and future work through precedents, procedures, and practices. Our is used in a second way that differs markedly from this first one. Uh, when the court chooses our in situations that call, in the eyes of the opinion author, for the claiming or construction of heritage as a guide to court action, 
Uh, for example, the flag salute case, West Virginia v. Barnett uh, from 1943, Justice Jackson pointed out, and I don't know why they always point this out in this, this tone of voice like this, you know, but, but they do. It's, it's really amazing. He pointed out, quote, the case is made more difficult not because the principles of its decision are obscure, but because the flag involved is our own, unquote. He added, quote, to believe that patriotism will not flourish if patriotic ceremonies are voluntary and spontaneous instead of a compulsory routine is to make an unflattering estimate of the appeal of our institutions to free minds, unquote. These usages of our set the stage for his famous proclamation, quote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein, unquote. Our can help contrast American ideals and traditions versus foreign ideals and traditions, refer to the American body politic, and even build a judicial heritage. And I should mention that, to be sure, there are a handful of other cases, other uses that don't really fit into one or the other, like you're of our Lord, which is a, a phrase that appears sometimes in the text. Okay, so we set out to attempt to be able to distinguish these different uses among court opinions. We built a modified quick tool that uh, used an open source library for part of speech tagging to produce tagged output. Since our is a possessive pronoun, here tagged PRPS, you can see it's sort of in the middle of these quotes, um, it occurs just before the noun or noun phrase that it possesses. With parts of speech identified, we could step through the words following our until we got to the noun which completed the noun phrase that was being modified by our. So our, our example in the first one here uh, from Barnett, own is the NN, NN is noun. Uh, so that immediately fo follows our, so okay, there we are. In the second one, we have an adjective, constitutional, shown by the JJ tag, uh, before we get to the NN noun constellation, meaning constitutional constellation is the noun phrase possessed by our. We then extracted these nouns and noun phrases, sorted them, and set our poor legal historian David to work uh, on categorizing them. Uh, to categorize, he took a copy of the list of unique follower nouns, sorted by the number of occurrences, and removed all of them that weren't heritage related. Um, sort of like that, the old story about how David, or how Michelangelo uh, did David. He just looked at a block of marble and chiseled away everything that wasn't David. You know, <laughs> pretty straightforward. So he chisels away everything that's not heritage, and then he makes another copy of the original thing and does the exact same process, chisels away everything that's not process. Um, and he did this all the way down uh, to uh, words that occurred 10 times or more uh, in our initial run. So uh, I want to say six, 700 uh, words at, at that point. And so after a check to ensure that there were no words on both lists, I could use these, two, these revised spreadsheets together with the original list to assign each follower noun to heritage, process, or uncategorized. Um, I should say that I'm going to show you some numbers here from, I'm showing you some numbers here from uh, this process, but these uncategorized ones, we're, we're making a second go around on that to, to get those numbers uh, much lower than this. So uh, this is in progress uh, stuff right here. So then once we've got these categorized, we can just map those categorized terms back on the quick data for each occurrence. Those in turn can be aggregated together to see, for example, if a particular opinion or case used the term predominantly in one way or the other, and the uses can be further aggregated by year or by any other data variable to suggest how uses have changed over time. Uh, well, my bad. You don't get to see that graph yet. So. Uh, for example, to take a quick look at the two cases I quoted a moment ago, uh, you can see that the number of uses of our in each of the opinions and how those break into heritage or process uh, according to our classification. You can see why we want to make further efforts uh, in taking care of the, the uncategorized ones, the less frequent ones, but the general pattern is pretty clear. Uh, in McCullough, both the majority and the dissent use our a few times, uh, but those uses are process uses. Uh, by contrast, in Barnett, uh, which is admittedly a rather extreme example of the use of, uh, of R, I should say, um, the majority opinion uses it frequently and primarily in a heritage constructing way. The concurrence is a little less clear, and the dissent uses it with a greater balance of heritage and process. If you read the opinion, the uses in the dissent that are heritage are often part of efforts to rebut the logic of the majority opinion. Uh, and then the process uses make a different kind of attack on the implications of the case. Uh, we've also hypothesized that there may be a call and response effect, that if a justice in the majority uh, invokes our heritage, then a, a dissenter may need to rep respond at least partly in, in kind, and, and certainly the pattern with Barnett would fit that. Now's the graph. Uh, when we put these ingredients together, we can generate uh, measures of these uses over time. So here you see the long arc of the usage of our in its various meanings. This, of course, happened before the n-gram tool, so you guys would probably make this uh, quite easy. Um, 
we see an interesting spike just prior to the Civil War, and then an uptick in uses beginning in the late 19th century. There's a somewhat more substantial increase beginning in the 1920s, with an acceleration in the 1930s and a bigger spike during World War II, as we had wondered. Uh, interestingly, however, the term becomes a much more common part of the court's discourse beginning in the 1970s, and in the 1980s brings even more usage, though largely in a process rather than in a heritage mode. This is uh, raw numbers of cases using this word. Um, okay, then a second one here. Um, now here on the this, this second slide, we look at the percentage of our using cases since 1920 to see how the proportions break out by year. Again, we're in the process of categorizing even more of those terms so that uncategorized uses, which are the middle line here, um, uh, will be added to either the green process line at the top or, or the purple heritage line closer to the bottom. Uh, but with this graph, we wanted to see if the, the uses in that post-1920 time period represented perhaps a new discourse of heritage construction uh, or, or what. Uh, and so it's interesting to us then to see that the places where the lines are closest together uh, represent the rise of a heritage classified discourse during World War II and the decade or two that followed. Um, that, this graph also suggests that the substantial ri rise of total cases uh, seen in the 1980s, total uses I should say, in the 1980s must have also been comprised largely of process uses. Uh, so perhaps the Rehnquist era court with the proliferation of separate opinions saw justices more frequently use process language as part of a rhetoric intended to construct or maintain voting majorities on narrow procedural grounds. Obviously we don't have all the answers. Another thing actually that historians are very comfortable with, we, we don't necessarily assume that we can have all the answers. Um, we don't have the, all the answers, uh, but the patterns we're uncovering with these digital tools applied to this full de text data set are, are provocative. So in sum, uh, our, in our digital exploration of the US Supreme Court's use of the word our, uh, we saw revealed uh, patterns of usage that changed over time, and we can analyze and aggregate how the justices have used the word to make arguments about heritage and process. We supplement these data-driven insights uh, in our paper with a close reading of, of two landmark decisions. Uh, our findings highlighted that there were eras during which the justices' historical consciousness was elevated, but also periods where the justices did not re rely on heritage markers. The close reading of heavy hour usage cases such as Furman, uh, which is a death penalty decision, and the steel seizure case, Youngstown, also helped us to think about how to refine our tools to address the problem of high rates of un uncategorized hour usage, <coughs> and how heritage rhetoric in particular could be mobilized in both concurring and dissenting opinions, albeit toward different ends. So to conclude, we see CAP full text data as an excellent platform upon which to build tools for digital legal history. Using the layered inquiry approach I describe here, we can dive progressively deeper, playing text, metadata, and outside data against each other over time. Some of our future projects include incorporating data from lower courts, working with legal concepts whose language is more difficult to distinguish in text, um, and distinguishing more uses, uses more fully by author, especially in Supreme Court dissents, um, which is also interesting then to hear uh, about Benjamin's uh, research assistant because I've spent some time with that particular problem. Um, the SCTB has a, a data set that is broken out by individual justice um, and connecting those things is uh, sometimes tricky. For example, in that list that he showed where it said the different names, yes, it's true most of the time you could probably get to pretty far with the, um, with the ones there, but I always worry about the edge cases. There are some where it's just Mr. Chief Justice. Who is Mr. Chief Justice? Well, that depends. I mean, when we first see that language, it's Sam and P. Chase, but later on, it's, it's other people, right? And so it, it's all kind of rooted in that historical one. Uh, Mr. Justice Harlan, oh, which one? You know, so um, historians say it's complicated. You know, pay attention. Um, and so we hope also, uh, so thank you for, for all these things. We also hope to being able to contribute to the CAP community uh, and helping make this a robust and collaborative one. And, and of course, I look forward to answering any questions that I possibly can about our project. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a, a fantastic question. And I think the thing that for us is really compelling about the Supreme Court is that um, its universe is fairly well defined and can be defined. And actually, this is a thing that, that is sort of complicated. If you look at the Supreme Court database, uh, it's 28,700 some odd um, opinions in that one from, from start to, to soon, uh, to recent. 
Um, if you look at those uh, those that are those opinions in cap, um, if you look at I should say the the ones that have the or supposedly from the U.S. Supreme Court, there's something like 384,000 of them. So I mean, there's something's weird, right? Um, if you look at uh, the uh, U.S. reports. Uh, versions from the Library of Congress that they did fairly recently. They have, I want to say, something like 33, maybe 38,000. These are figures from memory. Uh, individual cases identified uh, from the reporter thing. In Court Listener, it was like 61,000, something along those lines. So like, there's an awful lot of uh, wonderment, bewilderment about what exactly a, a case actually is or not. But compared to what's happening at the lower courts, the Supreme Court is a model of being able to to sort of pin that down, you know, comparatively speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Are there follow-ups? I was just I was just curious what part of speech geography you use, which one? Yeah, sure. I used since I was writing in Perl, I used uh, the it's uh, lingua en uh, tagger. Um, and it's, it was trained probabilistically. It comes as a package already trained. And so it does a fine job. It's not great, but it's, it's pretty close. Yeah. Um, so one of the uh, uh, subtasks in like NLP, there's this thing called co-reference resolution. Have you looked uh, at like the methods uh, they use, which is like they're trying to find what a word like he or like this refers to, and they use like probabilistic based models within like a corpus or something? I haven't looked at that particularly. I'm going to follow that up. Um, but I would say in general that historians are kind of alert, allergic to math. And so things that are probabilistic based on our sense of what things are, like our informed judgment, are very readily accepted. This is, this is the heart of our discipline. And that's why I can say, David, pick all the words out of here that are heritage construing, right? You know, I can do a thing like that. And it represents his individual judgment. But but when the math tells us that this is probably the case, that people get kind of weird about that. And so I would love to, to follow that up, but it, that's, that's one of those challenges that sort of informs what maybe sometimes seems like a rather unsophisticated way of uh, that we do of, of, of tackling this stuff. Yeah, thank you. Co-reference? Resolution. Resolution, thank you. Co-reference resolution. All right, well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, that concludes our...